Uh, good morning, everyone. Now, um, our journey to the cloud started somewhat um, unvoluntarily. It started with a perfect storm, and that's me in the picture with a rainbow very far in the distance. It started with um, Origin Energy back in August 2015, announcing that they would um, divest their majority shareholding and contact. And what that meant for us in IT is that we had to vacate the um, uh, jointly used data center um, in Sydney. At the same time, we had four key IT contracts uh, co-terminating in November 2016. And that meant we had to move out of our New Zealand data centers by um, November 2016 or else. So this is really what kick-started our migration. Um, and um, it was a journey of several years. We just completed it last year, and that's what I'm here to talk about today. Before I go, though, go there and into more detail, I just thought it might be pertinent to talk um, a little bit uh, background electricity market in New Zealand, uh, context role in it, before I go to detail on our journey, key takeaways, and what we're actually doing from here. So on the electricity market in uh, New Zealand, it is uh, deregulated. We are full privatized. You can buy our shares in New Zealand and uh, Australian stock exchange. It's highly stratified. So we are one of the five major uh, generators, and we are one of the 31 retailers. 31 retailers, 2.1 million consumers, that makes up an uh, awful lot of competition. We have high um, uh, degree of change of, um, uh, of, of, of retailers, churn as we call it, and that drives us to provide um, a, a superior experience for consumers uh, via digital channels. Um, we are uh, lucky enough in, in New Zealand to have the majority of our uh, electricity produced through uh, renewables. You can see how coal has um, uh, decreased in its importance and how geothermal has gone up. That's mm, due to no small degree to um, our investment in geothermal plants. We are quite passionate about uh, New Zealand's journey to um, a decarbonised um, economy. Now, context role in all this, um, here's a few uh, facts and figures, but what I wanted to point out on that slide is, and that's pertinent for our conversation today, we have 11 power stations, and they are in uh, sometimes far-flung parts of New Zealand. So um, power stations have to be able to operate, obviously, independent without any network connections. So we have little mini data centers attached to those uh, power stations, so SCADA uh, systems and other control systems still work. So those, at the moment, journey of the clouds are off limits. What we have moved over are two big uh, data centers in Wellington and Auckland. All the business applications have been vacated and have been moved. But it's not like all about um, uh, IT. Um, for us, when we say putting our energy where it matters, particularly since we are a privately owned uh, company, share um, traded, it's a balance between economical, environmental, um, and social responsibilities. Yes, our shareholders uh, do expect uh, strong cash flow, but we have a responsibility to our consumers. We have responsibility um, also to contribute to uh, address issues like energy poverty. Uh, our employees have expectation to enter a safe work workplace, uh, which uh, you, know, you need to work hard for in, in, in uh, environments like power plants. And uh, we have a strong role to play in the decarbonisation story of New Zealand's energy market. So, our, uh, back to the journey to public cloud. As I said, um, we had to move out of our New Zealand, uh, sorry, uh, Sydney data center. We had to vacate a couple of New Zealand-based data centers. So we set up a, um, a program of work that allowed us to select the right vendors, select the right partners, and do that in, uh, yes, uh, 12 months. And once you uh, go through all the commercial, the time that was left to do actually the, 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 the heavy lifting of the move started in February, and we uh, finished um, the move out of Sydney in September 2016 and New Zealand data centers in November. We had, in both cases, just a few days to spare. It probably was the closest run thing you ever saw. So um, in a schematic, that's really how it looked like. Um, so it was um, a move to a hybrid cloud. We had uh, selected a New Zealand-based Zealand private cloud for the majority of the workload. Uh, but we moved our SAP non-production systems and our SAP data warehouse into LRS in the Sydney region. Moving also meant for, at least for SAP, replatforming. We moved away from uh, 
HPUX uh, and Artanium um, architecture to um, Windows and Intel. Uh, that meant we also moved away from Oracle database to um, SQL Server, and our data warehouse we moved to SAP's proprietary in-memory database, HANA DB. Now, we had a, um, uh, sorry, and uh, yes, the, the core go goal was to move out of times, otherwise uh, penalty payments would have been due, and yes, we ho we're hoping to reduce costs. Now, what did we learn? Um, it was actually very interesting to have two clouds to compare, uh, because, um, yeah, we had the private cloud, we had the public cloud. Uh, we were quite um, inexperienced with cloud at that time, so to see actually, okay, there's all this automation capability in the public cloud, there's nothing in the private cloud was actually interesting. It educated us, I suppose, with the benefit of hindsight, what, what the possibilities of clouds um, can be. So. Uh, because we didn't look for automation, we didn't even know what that was, all our replatforming uh, started manually. So, so um, every, all new servers for SAP were built um, manually uh, by our partners. Now, we did achieve the cost savings we were hoping for, but I have to say it, was, um, uh, it required quite some hard work and a change in approach. So um, uh, we got a build shock in the first month, like probably most people do. And it was, uh, with a bit of hindsight, uh, a lack of hygiene. You know, uh, people were not used to uh, tidying up after themselves. We had terabytes of files lying around that we used for migrating data. Uh, but you know, um, infrastructure people who are used to buying kit, and then whether it's used or not, it doesn't make a difference. Well, they're not used to cleaning up. If you pay by the hour, it makes a huge difference. So we actually had to. Uh, key learning there was to instigate after the, this migration step an um, optimization program uh, that lasted six months with, uh, with dedicated team that would go ha after hard, um, the benefits, uh, reducing uh, superfluous resources and cutting down um, uh, hardware endowment where that was possible. If it was led by internal people, you're not going to get the same engagement um, uh, by partners, uh, outsourcing partners or, or contractors. Um, the lag between New Zealand and Sydney was not an issue. That was interesting, something we expected, because remember, we had already SAP operate out of Sydney. Um, but um, yeah, um, nothing, a few um, caching um, of static contact couldn't fix. Um, the, we were surprised how small the footprints were that SAP servers were running on in AWS compared to what we had. Um, in our dedicated data center. And that really set up uh, the appetite for more um, in, in, in next steps. Um, for the move of our New Zealand data centers, we actually found that a lot of the uh, virtual machines that were still running were completely obsolete and doing nothing. That just nobody had ever bothered to tidy up. There were also, um, uh, well, for those virtual machines that had been switched off, no one actually had bothered to consolidate that in a few numbers of servers. So, Again, if you own the hardware, there was no incentive to do so. Uh, so we found a lot of um, uh, things that we could just discard that were unused. Um, <clears throat> for those virtual machines we ended up moving, we actually um, uh, took a snapshot, exported, imported it into um, the private cloud. Probably, um, yeah, my biggest regret. Uh, while that seems easy and fast, uh, what it means uh, is that you're taking all the, uh, well, in some cases for us, 20 years of technical debt with you. And you will, you know, uh, these virtual machines are expected to work in a different uh, network environment. Uh, we had different antivirus agents, performance monitoring agents. You will spend um, uh, a lot of manual work uh, adjusting those virtual uh, machines into a new environment um, that was... Uh, not optimal, but we learned from that, and uh, that actually taught us why it is a good idea to do automation. So with that good experience, we, um, and during the optimization phase, we wrote a business case, and uh, we um, asked for investment to remove uh, the, our, our main uh, ERP system, SAP, the production side, into a public cloud. And that was uh, what our next project was about, Project Nimbus. That started uh, in July 2017. We finished in November 2017, so five months migration. Um, remember the pre-production, uh, sorry, the non-production was already in cloud, so it was about, about the production sites. Now, we had a four-tier architecture. We had a pre-production system that we were hoping to drop. So that was one of the key goals. We also did not want any more to have major systems for major projects hanging around, just so you had them. We wanted 
uh, to build them on demand. And to be able to do that, we needed to go hard towards automation. That mean, when I say automation, I mean automated provisioning of servers and, uh, right up to um, SAP application servers and database servers. So we had really uh, infrastructure um, as code. So um, we had a few sort of single points of failure in, in our private cloud with SAP. We want to remove those. And uh, we also had um, you know, things like load balancers we procured as appliances at great cost. We wanted to replace them with cloud native services in, um, uh, in AWS. So that uh, went live on time, on budget. And uh, so the key learnings from it was um, that uh, like for like, the hardware architecture seemed to perform better in AWS um, than compared to our private cloud. Um, interesting because you know th there's no magic CPUs being used; it's all the same. It just seems to be architected in the way that it really is taking the last inch of um, performance out of uh, what's available. Um, we didn't rely on that. We did quite some uh, performance testing before we went live. We calculated uh, the hardware we would require, uh, number of CPUs, memory, and the good stuff um, uh, for, for peak load. We doubled that for go live and went live. And then uh, over the next three to four weeks, cut that back. You know, uh, if you don't own the things, you can do that in the cloud. It's quite, quite good to have that safety margin. Um, so. As we hoped for, the standardized build and the consistent build uh, via, of the service via scripts, um, it had the effect that we could uh, drop the pre-production tier. We needed to put a pre-production tier. If you have a hybrid cloud, if you have you know, your non-production in one cloud, say AWS as we had, and your production in, in another cloud, uh, despite best efforts, you will be uh, have done different kernel versions, patching levels. You actually need a test rig. In, your, in, your, in the cloud that you have um, your production system in. Obviously, then having everything in the same cloud and having every, everything built by script, that was obsolete. So we could uh, drop that one. It was a major saving. Um, what we didn't quite expect was that how much easier that made, for example, our patching. Right? Everything now was in the same version. No surprises, no exceptions, nothing um, uh, failing during the night. It was absolutely fantastic. Um, so um, that ability to stand up new servers by uh, uh, using scripts, you know, um, in the bad old days when we had our own dedicated data centers, once you ordered the, the server, well, once it was installed, it was 12 to 16 weeks to stand up a new major environment. We were cutting that down to um, three days. So you know, you don't need a major environment. You just build one when, and you tear it down when, when, uh, when the use is over. Not all is rosy, though, so um, um, SAP and actually any other ERP system, you know, they can't deny their, uh, their mainframe heritage. So um, uh, you have to architect around that. Um, the cloud is scalable, but SAP is not, not easily. So it's not like a web server, you throw a resource at it and they'll make use of it by spawning new word processes. It doesn't work that way. It has to be pre-configured with an SAP. If you throw a res uh, resources at it, it doesn't know what to do with it. So, so um, um, auto-scaling with these classic um, ERP systems will not easily work. Uh, it may with newer versions, but not the ones that most people have installed. So. Um, what we thought then about, OK, let's have lots of um, small application servers that we can uh, bring up and down. But that didn't work either due to some quirks um, that SAP had consuming uh, CPU. Um, look, at the end of the day, uh, it doesn't matter which uh, um, ERP or which uh, program you're using. There will always be some quirks with these non-cloud uh, non native uh, workloads if you bring them on and you have to architect around it. Uh, but uh, the result was actually really, really positive. Uh, the performance went uh, noticeably up from, from what we had in the private cloud. And uh, it set up the appetite for more. And um, uh, yeah, so during the first part of 2018, we, we guess, uh, wrote the next business case. And uh, we went to the next project, the next log log logical step, Project Stratus that we just finished last month. We started in Inga in September last year. That was to bring all our non-SAP applications over to public cloud. Some, a, a collection of some 70 applications, uh, 180 servers. And interesting enough, uh, again, we were able to retire quite a number of servers. 
that retirement of service was possible because uh, we had in a private cloud, uh, you know, it wasn't infinitely uh, scalable. So we actually had to have in uh, uh, the secondary data center some servers uh, just to be there in case there was a catastrophic failure in the primary data center. So um, uh, that is not required anymore. Uh, we wanted to extend our automation of our server builds. As I said, we had uh, built, uh, we had automatic provision of SAP servers. We wanted that for all our applications. Um, we wanted to make more use of RDS databases. Um, so RDS is AWS's um, uh, database as a platform, if you will. Um, and uh, yeah, we wanted to use that for our SQL and Oracle databases. And um, yeah, we wanted to find more uh, on-premise servers and on-premise builds that we could replace um, with um, uh, software as a service. And as always, reduce costs. Now, um, what we learned here Yes, we were successful in um, building um, our servers on a few standard builds. We have a number of templates. Uh, all our servers uh, are built on that. You know, we have uh, some templates for Windows servers, for, uh, for Linux servers. We now have one um, Linux distribution. Uh, we are on a true N minus um, one uh, uh, pathway, so we have the current release and, and one back, but not five, you know, as we used to have in the bad old days. So the so standardization that that brings and the efficiency in your operations is quite remarkable. Um, we did find some opportunities to retire some some uh, on-premise builds. Um, yeah, more load balancers retired, but also interesting enough, some some. Uh, multi-factor authentication, other authentication services that we could retire and uh, go to software as a service. Um, now, um, we had a few uh, opportunities to retire and purchase, uh, uh, sorry, and repurchase. You know, silly things like uh, with our different um, power stations and receptions, we found we had different, uh, five different registrations applications. It doesn't make any sense. So, you know, you, you throw away what you don't need and you, you standardize on one if you can do it simply. Um, <clears throat> coming back to the uh, optimizing high availability and disaster recovery, um, I'll pick one example. Um, uh, some people may be familiar with um, uh, TIPCO. It's, we use it as our uh, core enterprise integration uh, engine and um, um, service bus. So uh, we had um, we, re we reviewed how we had distributed the different TIPCO services on servers. We had in the past uh, a cold standby uh, for DR. The high availability was patchy, didn't always work. Um, so we re-engineered that. Um, we have a highly reliable um, high availability scenario. We've tested it a number of times. Works flawlessly, it's really great. Uh, we have a, a, a hot standby now and um, uh, for DR, and we managed to reduce it from 19 to eight servers. Absolute uh, great success story. Now, again, um, not all is cold and not all is easy. Uh, what, what we found there, you will find and discover all the technical debt that you never had, you uh, knew you had. So some of these applications, again, they're not, uh, some of them are custom, some of them are like, um, some are quite old, and uh, they were, they're not cloud native by any stretch of imagination. They are, uh, we found applications that were in, in, in extremely sensitive to lag between the database server, application server, uh, even being in the, despite always being the same region, even being in say different uh, availability zones. We were, you know, data centers, all data centers in Sydney was too much. We had to re-engineer re around it. We found. Um, um, databases um, that were uh, in queries that were performing fine uh, on in, in the private cloud needed additional indices. We found um, we found uh, query strings for analytics spreadsheets out there in the power stations that were requesting hundreds of thousands of records that went in one by one by one. You do that hundred thousand times, thirty millisecond round trip. Of course, you know the whole thing tanked. Uh, you adjust the, the, the uh, query, sorry, the query string to get 20,000 records and come back, and now it's actually running faster than it ever did. But you will find those things, and you need to be ready for it to adjust those, because um, you know there there there, there will be um, um, uh, hidden technical debt that you have to address. What we didn't achieve was a substantive use of RDS. It's unfortunate. We would have liked to do more. Um, but um, uh, our applications use a lot of enterprise features um, uh, that are not all supported on AWS's RDS offering. So you have to check very, very carefully 
what um, database features your application uses. And if you do need an enterprise license, uh, then it is reasonably likely that the IBS will not work for you. And you might have to uh, install your own um, uh, database cluster, and that's what we ended up doing. You will also find old applications that uh, use old uh, encryption standards, TLS1. We find a, a few of those, so we had to isolate them. So what I'm saying is, at the end of the day, that th there will be lots of technical debt. You can architect yourself uh, around it, is our experience. We did not have to go back and refactor anything, so we could stay clear of the architecture level, and that's what we wanted, uh, sorry, the application level. Uh, um, all the adjustments could be made either on infrastructure, network, or database level. Um, we didn't have to re-engineer any applications or upgrade an application uh, before we migrated, which was a great success for us. So, key takeaways. Well, for me, it's not just the technology, it's a culture change. So remember what I said, we needed to find a new way of working. Um, we, the, the, the benefits don't, and not just the monetary benefits, also agility, responsiveness, they don't come by themselves. And um, yes, we tried to outsource at the beginning, that didn't work, so we actually had to rethink our stance about insourcing, outsourcing. I have a very small, but very capable internal team. Um, we didn't have that. Uh, we didn't have any infrastructure architects. Um, we do now, and um, so uh, there, there is a re was a restructure and a, um, a re rethinking of what service we're procuring involved. And um, yes, also thinking about governance. You know, we, we in, in, in a, uh, with our private cloud, we uh, routed all changes through uh, a service provider, and that added, you know. Uh, two weeks overhead and lodging the ticket, getting response data. It's just taken away the promise of cloud being responsive, uh, doing something quickly, experimenting, failing, tearing it down, or, or taking successes forward. So, so um, that didn't work for us. So, and if you take sort of this, this different way of working, different governance, different um, insourcing, outsourcing, mix, different organizational structure, it's a culture change. If you want to take away the benefits that, that this can offer. It's not going to work uh, one for one in, with, with, with the old approaches, is my advice. The other thing here that's, for me, key uh, from a technology point of view, I would um, never again, as we had in the first, uh, take a, uh, a carbon copy of a virtual machine, slide it over, install it. It's not worth it. Um, so the benefits we got out of... Um, um, out of building the servers uh, via script um, from scratch, basically replatforming all our servers, uh, all applications. Um, they're, they're beyond what we were hoping for. As I said, uh, standardization of patching, standardization um, uh, of behavior stability, um, it's, it's, it's absolutely great. And it set us off, it set off um, in terms of building capability to further automation because um, you have to ask yourself once you migrate it, well, we are from here, and automation is one of the key things. Um, from a business per perspective, uh, I hear sometimes people don't see as saving uh, uh, money and costs as, as a key target. For us, it has been a huge money saver. We reduced our hosting cost uh, by about two-thirds, so almost 70%. Absolutely, for a, size, a company of our size, that's, uh, that's um, absolutely tremendous. And uh, if you think of the public sector being able to um, you know, transfer that to health outcomes or outcomes for citizens, it's, um, it's certainly worthwhile considering. But it's not just about money, it's also about the speed of um, the applications being much more responsive um, we ha and, and being able to uh, bring new energy products to the market a lot quicker. Uh, was, was an amazing outcome for, for my business colleagues. Uh, increased stability is not just um, about easier patching and stuff like this. It's also, you know, it means uh, less with disruption, right? So for the employees, less disruption, less downtime, um, less downtime on our digital channels for our consumers. So um, uh, that certainly was um, a significant contributor to um, our increased NPS net promoter score that we um, achieved with our consumers. And an improved security stance. So, you know, we now have all our data ingress, egress um, going through a web application firewall. We have micro segmentation of our accounts within AWS. 
Um, and we have um, uh, now a monthly patching cycle for all our servers. It's something that just wasn't possible when we had a zoo of different things. So, so um, great uh, gains here as well. So where from here? Well, as I said, we actually completed now our migration, which seems um, after a number of years <laughs> quite astounding. But um, you know, there's always something else to do. So for us, um, I mentioned automation. So it's, it's taken the automation journey further, right? Building on the skills we we um, we have and and on the building blocks we have created. So, so as part of the migrations, we, as I said, we build scripts to build servers, we build scripts to shut down and start up servers and um, uh, solutions. Uh, if something as complex as SAP, that's actually a script and a half in its, in its own right. So um, uh, we, we, we have automated patching. So you know, we've got all the building blocks. It's now uh, about finding a way to orchestrate the different steps. So we have um, uh, a more or less automated um, approach to patching. Um, so that's one of the key things. Um, uh, we also have um, uh, the intent to refresh our um, uh, test systems automatically on a monthly basis. Uh, where our test, uh, refreshing test systems is always a bit of a mission, and uh, you know that um, is not good for testing outcomes. So we want to automate that. Uh, when I talk about explore new ways of working, it is about going towards containerization and serverless computing. That is difficult, if not impossible, for some of the older applications, but there are opportunities, and we want to take them. We're also um, putting some of our um, APIs that we use to service our digital channels into, um, uh, into LBS uh, using serverless computing, Lambda functions, and API gateway. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we want to put up guardrails. Uh, DevSecOps uh, is our goal there. So if you heard about that, it's basically taking your policies, your security policies, and have them automatically supervised by um, AWS functions. So um, uh, we got inspired there by Australia Post. Um, they, I think they've been here as well. I'd, I'd advise you to look at, uh, into that as well. It's, 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 it's really great. So then we have um, uh, a number of uh, new cloud capabilities. Now, all the data being in cloud makes it a lot easier for us to actually use that data and do something useful with it. Um, so you know, we have all our time of use data, so from the smart meters in, in cloud. We have all the um, uh, call recordings of, of our call centers uh, in the cloud. They are audio files. You know. Uh, turning them to text, uh, turning them into sentiment and analysis is something we embarked on. Um, time of use data, use that for consumption analysis, use that, using that for um, yeah, forecasting for our trading, energy trading. Uh, and here an example, monitoring of the customer experience. Um, so you know, everyone monitors their hardware, but what does it actually mean for the customer? How does the customer experience uh, various different channels? We collect that data, we, we, we ingest some test transactions, we correlate that with the uh, system performance that we see. So if something is not behaving as we expect, we actually know why and where that is and what we need to do. Um, if something falls out of expected parameters, at, at the very least we can log a ticket in our uh, service test system. Uh, in some cases, uh, um, we can trigger some, some functions to self-heal using Lambda functions. So again, a lot easier with everything now in, in cloud and having access to those tools. And uh, that will be um, the next step of our journey. So, um, but that's really all I had for today. So um, uh, we have one minute, um, probably not much time for questions, but I'll be here if you wanted to have a chat. Um, Clive knows where I live. If you wanted to get in touch uh, with me after the conference, I'd be happy to take calls and stuff and questions. So thank you very much for uh, coming, and uh, good luck with your journey. Thank you.